Hey there, fourth trimester listeners. Our program today is proudly sponsored by Family Album, your secure haven for sharing baby photos and videos. Head over to the App Store today, search Family Album, one word, download the app, and start creating a legacy of love, one photo at a time. Hi, I'm Sarah Trott, and welcome to the Fourth Trimester Podcast. I'm a new mama, and this podcast is all about postpartum care for the first few months following birth, the time period also known as the Fourth Trimester. My postpartum doula, Esther Gallagher, is my co-host. She's a mother, grandmother, perinatal educator, birth and postpartum care provider. Fourth Trimester Care, our topic, is about the practical, emotional, and social support parents and baby require. And importantly, it helps set the tone for the continuing journey of parenting. Hello, listeners. It's Esther without Sarah today, sadly, but I'm on my own. But I have a fantastic guest. It's Beth Reese, who is a wonderful doula friend of mine and a wonderful herbalist who points her herbalism in the direction of the perinatal period. So I've been just dying to have Beth come on and today she's actually made it. Before we start, I just want to remind listeners that you can subscribe to this podcast at fourthtrimesterpodcast.com. And we also have a Patreon page. So if you're willing and able, we would sure appreciate any kind of little sponsorship you're willing to do. So back to the podcast, Beth, is going to give us a little professional introduction, tell us about her doula and herbalist background, and then we're going to launch in and talk about all things perinatal herbal. Hi, Beth. So lovely to have you. Hi, Esther. Hi, listeners out there. Thanks so much for having me on the fourth trimester today. It's such a thrill to be on a podcast of um, and being in such great company with yourself and Aww. Sarah, who I got to work with um, behind the scenes. And so, yes, thank you. Oh, I love thank this stuff. you. Yeah, it's pretty fun. I agree. Yeah. So, Beth, tell us a little bit about your um, professional background, sort of what who you are, what led you to being an herbalist and a doula. What's your story? Yeah. So uh, what my deal is, is prior to being a a San Francisco resident, I had a career and life in higher education in and around the Santa Cruz, California area. And it was actually when I was working for the university at the Women's Center on campus that in um, one of my um, mentoring relationships with a student that she was describing what she was looking to be doing with her career. And she was talking about things like Ina Mae Gaskin and wanting to become a midwife and start doing doula work. And this was in like 2004. Five ish. And at that point, I had never heard the term doula. And so I did this. The question that we receive all the time is, what is a doula? Mm-hmm. And she described this support knowledgeable person that is part of the team to help accompany birthing, laboring, and postpartum people in their journey into parenthood and to help them during these big transitions with informational, practical, and emotional support. And I was like, whoa, that sounds really neat. And Mm. I think, yeah, we need that more because I had been prior working with a lot of families in really intense and even violent situations, doing a lot of domestic violence counseling and things like that. And so in my mind, I was like, oh, this is a way to help unpack some of that history before it even starts. And it it synced up with my um, best friend becoming pregnant. And she was one of the first of us to start going down that, that path of uh, motherhood. And she asked me to be at her birth. And me being the total nerd geek that I am was wanting to take a class on it because honestly, I was like, holy hell, (laughs) this seems birth is huge and immense and I want to know as much as I can. And, you know, as you know, Beth, it's not something that we just absorb 
in our upbringings as women in this culture. Exactly. So we have to go to a source. We have to geek out if we want to know anything. Yeah. It, it's so true. Um, you know, gone are those days where we're sitting in circle watching folks birth and supporting them birth and helping them breastfeed their babies and being around that. Um, and, you know, it, it, it really did create this place of me um, unpacking all of my stuff around like why I did burst into tears when I saw a birth happen and on like a on a video or something like that i was like because it is truly moving it is truly a heart opening event uh, so fast forward uh had this amazing experience with my best friend that literally was a heart opening experience like i can still feel and see those what it felt like to see my best friend's daughter crown and mm -hmm. it just shook me. And it's, I, over the next sub subsequent years, I transitioned from that of a higher education professional to that of a sustainable professional doula moved to San Francisco and um, have been actively working with families ever since then. The, the herb component um, found me while I was making that transition. Mm -hmm. And so I can say, you know, from experience while also talking about all the lovely elements of incorporating herbal medicine into your own life, that it really is there to help support transitions. And yeah. it helped my transition into this of the birth world. And as a professional who is there to help support people nourishing themselves, the herbs themselves help nourish the professional. So it's this real beautiful dynamic of yeah. like th this, this herbal education found me and I got to be trained with the, the clinical herbalists through the American school of herbalism, which has transformed into um, a couple of different entities, but they're still going strong through many of the herbalists um, who are also um, acupuncturists that uh, have really had this integrated approach of working with the modalities and herb knowledge base basis of traditional Chinese medicine, as well as the herb allies that hang out in our neighborhoods. So those that grow in our regions and in where we live, uh, the, the California coastal slash Sierra foothills area, all the way to, you know, how to work with herbs that we find only here. And then how just to know that this is a very localized approach, but working with energetics and healing modality things that traditional Chinese medicine offers so that you can think of like echinacea as something that has a, an energetic usage in TCM. So really, nice. so that's the, the, the herbal background that I came from um, with my, my mentors and teachers and have been applying that to that of the perinatal time frame, where, like you were talking before, it's really about nourishment. Mm -hmm. This is this is the time of working with gentle giants and nourishing the mom and getting um, that that time and space with getting to have built-in self-care rituals like creating a tea for yourself mm -hmm. or sitting in a herbal sits bath or whatever it looks like for the for you as the person who's welcoming that into your life. Yeah. Well, I know it's just a foundation of my practice as a doula, and I'm certain of yours as well, um, that each of uh, the new mothers that I'm working with um, during during the time that I'm spending with them in the first two weeks, uh, is every day going to have you know foods that are nourishing mm -hmm. and teas that are nourishing and where appropriate an herbal bath. Those are just the three things that are going to happen on yeah. my watch. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, in addition to sitting and listening, witnessing, um, sometimes advising, sometimes just supporting people and finding their best answers to whatever it is. Mm -hmm. So, so you can see, I think, listeners, that um, 
herbalism for, I'm imagining, many doulas, uh, even if it's just some very, very basic, fundamental, nourishing herbs, is a part of the care that we hope to bring to our clients and perhaps help them establish in their own self-care right. rituals for right. their days, going forward for the rest of their lives, perhaps. I didn't know a thing about herbal care until I had my daughter. And then it came out of the woodwork. <laughs> and it's like, I always think of this stuff as like, you know, like Wizard of Oz going from black and white to Technicolor sometimes. Yeah. And, uh, That's lovely. And herbalism, you know, sort of had that effect on me as well as seeing that with with the families and people that we support it because these transitions really are as dramatic as going from black to and black to white to a full color um experience and it's interesting that you say that you you know it came into being when you became a mother mm -hmm. and that's how this stuff happens like we start uh we're the first ones to sort of introduce it as a practice for ourselves and then we're able to like carry that forward and we need and the, the the herbs that are really nourishing especially the ones that are listed in the notes uh hint hint there are notes for this <laughs> podcast if you yes. want to follow up with specifics um because there's a lot of material to cover and we can't yeah. do it all right here but that those are those are the gentle giants that are able to and be used with kids Yes. At a very young age, mm -hmm. even working with the idea that for the first three months or so, any herbal medicine that's going to be brought in for the newborn often is going through the mother, meaning the mother is taking the herbs. Mm -hmm. The mother is uh, helping them get to the baby through her breast milk or through the, the beneficial effects of these nourishing herbs, things like... Uh, chamomile and nettles and milky oat and things that really can help uh, a new parent's nervous system as well as provide crucial minerals like calcium and magnesium things that the body needs for the recuperation mm -hmm. um, and then you know once kids get and babies get more established beyond three months. And especially as they get closer to introducing solids into their diet, the world uh, really opens up. And we know that there's different ways of taking herbs. You can take them internally and externally. So, you know, things that get used for like diaper creams or diaper salves for babies, there's stuff that Frankly, there I would never want someone to use. Mm -hmm. And then there's stuff that has herb in the formulation to actually help the diaper area heal. Yeah. Things like calendula, things like Oregon grape root can help minimize candida levels. But that's for external use. Like I want mm -hmm. to be given those, except maybe the calendula internally. But that was would be you know ways of introducing them slowly. Mm -hmm. And as you build confidence and get to know these herbs more, yeah. it's really helpful. Yeah. I mean, let's just say that um, calendula is the foundational herb for this mother's sitz baths because it's so soothing mm -hmm. to skin and mucous membranes. Yes. So soothing. And, uh, you know, your baby has just come through your uterus, vagina, vulva, and um, those lady parts might be a little tender. But we also know that uh, calendula, it makes a wonderful skin wash for any number of conditions. And Beth is now naming candida, which, is a, which we sometimes think of as, as a yeast infection. And um, right, babies yeast. sometimes get that on their bottoms. Yep. So rather than those, whatever's on those diaper wipes, you know, you can brew up a simple little infusion and... Swab your baby's bottom with it. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. And, you know, if if a partner has an ulcer, they can drink tea of calendula tea, and that would help the, internally. That's and fantastic. so there's all these really cool applications depending on um, the person and what the need is. And, um, and it's not even that you have to get 
have to get to know a ton of herbs. I mean, I think if you're totally into it, go for it. Um, sure. And I, you know, what I was taught that I've really hold, held on to is that getting to know a handful of herbs deeply is and how they apply to all these different stages of life is something that is worth your time and a very approachable gateway into this whole amazing world. Because we're, you know, to be to be fair, we're really talking about herbs that are um, both found and cultivated in this area and coming from a Western or a traditional Chinese medicine background. And there's a, there's a, there's cultures of herbs all over the place. And mm-hmm. just to fully acknowledge that, that that's what we have to offer here. And there's also all these different worlds of herbs, depending on your background, where you're living, um, cultural practices, and that there really are a lot of, ways to incorporate this, especially in the postpartum time. And, Mm -hmm. you know, we're, we're talking about what we're talking about, but there's a world out there. I think of um, what a revelation it was for me to find out that um, so many of the East Indian culinary herbs, um, uh, you know, that we just enjoy when we go out for Indian food, you know, um, there's a handful of those that are, very specifically used for very important transitions, as you're calling them yep. appropriately, Beth. Um, uh, in terms of things like, you know, getting mom's milk production off to a good start and um, helping to heal and, and recover the mom uh, physiologically. And that, that, you know, that this is what I loved about it was saying, oh, but this is incorporated into everyone's food, right? Everyone eats right. these herbs right? Um, because they're good for mothers. Like it occurred to me like, oh, this is part of the Indian diet because they're good for mothers. Mm. Whether or not that's yeah. sort of um, uh, part of the, the explicit uh, mm-hmm. idea or, or lore or education that people get. It's like, oh, it's foundational to this ancient culture that things that are good for women Mm -hmm. are good for everybody. Yes. (laughs) Right. Now, I'm just making that up, but I bet you (laughs) that, um, you know, this isn't far from the minds of Indian herbalists, you know, that, that, um, you know, we really want to protect the mother. Right. Right. Yeah. Right. And nourish the mother. And nourish her thereby nourishing, protecting the baby. Right. And protecting the culture. And, Mm -hmm. and it's, it's, it's really elegant, obviously Mm -hmm. how this all interplays, but, you know, looking at herbalism as a real, um, cultural, uh, need as well as a, a part of how, uh, how we sustain ourselves Mm -hmm. and going back to this idea that a lot of these herbs, are around helping the body nourish the basics in terms of help helping with building strong blood vessels, Mm -hmm. helping with general GI tract function, you know, making things smooth, helping things come out, um, Mm -hmm. helping with kidney function so that um, we are able to regulate all of our electrolytes. And so we have good heart function and, you know, the, Mm -hmm. it goes on and on helping with blood pressure, helping with better sleep cycles, helping to sort of calm our nervous system into that. And, um, that is really sort of the hallmark of these herbs is that most of the time, these are going to be things that are helping the body fine tune its own innate ability to function, Mm -hmm. um, while having those, the, the medicinal properties attributed to, um, these different classes and um, characterizations and classifications of herbs yeah. being these things. And I imagine, Beth, you would, you would um, say that it's no small thing that many of the applications for, for herbs that are both nourishing and healing are come to us in the forms of the form of teas 
especially for new moms and babies, yep. because one component of keeping people healthy is keeping them well hydrated. Exactly. And, you know, it's often the case that um, a water source isn't uh, necessarily all completely clean. But by boiling that water and adding the herbs, which may also have, you know, an antibacterial in some cases Mm -hmm. component, we're actually providing people with super nourishing, healthy, safe um, hydration as well. Exactly. And we in, in the West tend to, at the moment, take for granted our water sources. Um. And don't take near the advantage of them that we maybe could in terms of staying hydrated. And it is so critical for for a pregnant woman, breastfeeding mother, infants and and babies growing up to be well hydrated. Everyone needs good hydration. The elderly are are in this country are uh, chronically dehydrated and it leads to memory function dysfunction um, and everything else. Right. So, um, the fact that we can brew up a cup of tea and get all these benefits is, uh, pretty phenomenal. Yeah, it really is. And it's really in line with all, uh, with some of the other really nourishing, um, elements to parts of our diet that like the making of a stock or a stew Mm -hmm. that, you know, it's, I think of a tea as pretty much a, you know, a type of stock or a stock as a type of tea because we're Mm -hmm. using water as the solvent to help extract the things that we want from it, either it simply being flavor or we're looking to help extract, you know, the uh, collagen or we're looking to have the iodine from the seaweed come out or whatever it is so that, and it's, it's really accessible, accessible because like you're speaking to, we as humans are usually in the pursuit of water and water is that essence of life. And in the pregnancy, we increase our blood volume by like one and a half. And mm-hmm. because of all that, having something that's super accessible, like we need to hydrate ourselves, we need to drink water. Well, you know, if we were just talking before we started um, uh, recording that, like there's some folks that don't want to drink water and we're like, well, if you make a tea, they might drink water because Mm -hmm. it's still a a non-caffeinated, non-sugar based drink that they're able to get hydration from in a very clean easy way and it's very accessible that way not only that beth i would say in some cases it's a superior uh form of hydration because specifically what you've been saying about the mineral content sometimes the water soluble vitamin content you know way 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 back in the old days most of our water sources would have been well mineralized Right, because right. that rainwater yes. would be running over the rocks or seeping down through the soil right. and into, into the, the watershed, into the yeah. watershed, into the wells, into the, and yeah. then coming back up in the form of springs, and it, that water would have healthy bacteria and um, m- minerals, all of which help our body absorb and hold that hydration. Mm-hmm. Pure H two O isn't a hydrating beverage per se. It's a nice solvent, but it doesn't necessarily stick. Right. Right. It might exactly. be a great flush for our kidneys and our liver, but it doesn't stick in the cells. Right. And so we need those very minerals that you were mentioning to be part of the component of the water that we're drinking. So people who are drinking filtered water um, and some white water is highly filtered. Some is even distilled. There's no mineral Mm -hmm. content in that. So there's a limit to the hydration you can afford yourself. So, you know, just simply using that water to extract the benefits Mm -hmm. from those herbs is, Mm -hmm. is a huge plus. And you can drink these things often hot or cold, depending on the best application, right? Right. Do you want to talk about heat and cold a little bit? Um, from your yes, your... so in terms of um, an approach for the postpartum time frame, um, 
it within many cultural contexts, but specifically within like traditional Chinese medicine at TCM, um, there is the, the importance of helping the mother maintain and regain her, her heat or her, her warmth to her constitution because the act of childbirth is such an opening and a release of vital fluids like blood and water and shit, um, mm-hmm. <laughs> to mm-hmm. use a, a very, uh, you know, yeah. anyways, nope. to Anglo-Saxon, go great Anglo-Saxon. Yeah. Right just being real. Um, yeah. <laughs> so th- that because and of the actual opening of the pelvic girl with a new, uh, with a baby coming through there, that, that opens the mother up to being susceptible to cold inflammation and, um, the possibility of invasion from things like microbes or infections, um, and wanting to help the mother maintain and regain that heat by having the food, the teas, and even the herbs that she is ingesting or Z is ingesting that there is a a warming element to those things so that we're helping that person who's gone through this big transition maintain and sustain that warmth. Mm -hmm. And so many of these, uh, what Esther was speaking to with tea and the temperature of tea, like the literal temperature of tea, we may want to really encourage someone to be drinking more of a warm, hot tea or even neutral. So like room temperature mm-hmm. um, type but of not tea, cold. but not necessarily cold. Mm-hmm. It, it, I think this is where you really have to look at the, the metabolism and the, and the, the, the constitution of the mom, because mm-hmm. there are some moms that are just, really, really warm. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I've had some of them, some folks that are really, really warm and specifically even presenting with, um, eczema and forms of, of excess. Mm -hmm. Yes, exactly. Mm -hmm. So with, with that, we have to always keep things like that in mind. And the approach that I work with my clients and because I'm their doula and Mm -hmm. not their clinical acupuncturist or, clinical herbalists in many cases, um, I, I check in with them about what sounds good to them. Most of the time, it's maybe 0.5 out of 10, <laughs> meaning that uh, some folks say they want cold, but actually we get into it and warm often feels better, both mm-hmm. in the herbal sits baths that they're applying to their perineum, to the teas that they are drinking, um, mm-hmm. trying to have that more warming effect and bringing warmth back into the, the body so that even things like um, postpartum organ prolapse is being addressed in a preventative function because what we're looking at fueling the body to help maintain its own place so Mm -hmm. that that uterus yeah while that core Mm -hmm. that that burner is Mm -hmm. staying in in the right place for where it's supposed to be while it's still going through its transition don't get me wrong like the uterus is still going it has a journey Mm -hmm. and we want the body to have enough vital energy or chi to be able to maintain the appropriate place for where that person is in their recovery Mm -hmm. or in their transition. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Lovely. I think, um, you know, I, uh, critique lovingly, I think, (laughs) I hope, uh, often the way we do birth in, uh, the West in America specifically, um, where we keep people, where everyone assumes they're going to hospital because unfortunately they're not well informed about the home birth option. But, um, so listen to our episode about, um, why not home people? (laughs) And, and they, uh, they spend a couple of days in hospital and then make the physical transition, you know, home right on day three. Right. And with, with no support, right? That, that transition is just get yourself home. We don't, <laughs> we don't need to see Good you anymore. Luck. You're fine. Yeah. Good luck. See you in six weeks. Yeah. And, um, it occurs to me in, in hearing what you had just to say just now, Beth, that, 
you know, it could be a really powerful tool to have our birth clients, those of us who do birth, um, equipped with, you know, a particular tea and a big thermos <laughs> mm-hmm. because day two and three are such a major transition. Even if you do not have to get into a moving vehicle, they're yep. a big transition. Do you want to make any suggestions there or just, um, Give us some ideas about the sorts of things that right off the bat yeah. are going to be a good thing to just have with you. And and that, by the way, you'll have to plan for since they're not available if you're having a, a hospital birth. Yeah. So going back to what you mentioned at the beginning of, uh, the, of the podcast around sort of like the trifecta of herbs uh, sets that people sort of work with, like a pregnancy tea, mm-hmm. a postpartum slash lactation tea, and an herbal sits bath, mm-hmm. um, that pregnancy tea can be your entry point into herbalism usage during your postpartum time frame. Mm-hmm. It hits does, all those notes we talked about. It hits all those notes minerals exactly and it it you know just as a rule um anything that you use and in five during pregnancy is safe for the postpartum time frame especially with with breastfeeding so without having to go out and like get a, a totally new set i would say a lot of my clients end up having like extra pregnancy tea and they're like what do I do with this I'm like you drink it still because it 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 has those it has those nourishing herbs and usually and the building blocks of the the pregnancy tea are also the building blocks of the postpartum tea and usually the two that we always see is a red raspberry leaf Mm -hmm. known um, as a uterine tonic a uterine tonic which is fascinating and actually talk about that yeah exactly Mm -hmm. um and then also nettles and Mm -hmm. those two we pretty much see in all postpartum teas as Mm -hmm. well as all pregnancy teas and i would even just say to all everyone out there that um whether or not you have a uterus (laughs) nettles is such a mineral rich friendly herb it's good for everybody throughout your life wouldn't you say that i really would i mean besides the f- the fact that it does have this history of being an herb, it also has this extensive history of being a food. Yes, a vegetable. And yeah. foods we get Delicious. nutrients from. Mm-hmm. And nettles is high in vitamin C, vitamin A, iron, and magnesium, and calcium. And so yep. you're like, <laughs> we're just going to drop the mic there and like yeah. walk away because <laughs> nettles really hits a lot of those, a lot of those notes. And probably trace elements that we're, you know, we don't even have to know about. Exactly. I'm guessing, you know, if it's grown on, if it's growing itself on the kind of soil it likes, which it always does, mm-hmm. that's what it likes to do, um, then it's drawing from that soil those other elements that are also important to humans that we only get from our vegetables. Yeah. Right. Right. And if we're able to get it through these teas, I mean, the, I would say that one of my approaches for the new parent is go towards ease. You already have enough challenge and enough transition and enough difficulty. So, you know, go with what is as accessible as possible Mm -hmm. for, for these things. Hey, fellow parents, can we take a moment to reflect on the joyous chaos that is parenthood? You know, those days when our hearts swell with love at the sight of our little ones, and we're bursting at the seams to share every adorable moment with the world. But let's be real. Some things are better kept in the family and your loved ones who matter the most aren't always close by, and they might not be that tech savvy either. So how can you easily share your baby's beautiful growth with loved ones while keeping your precious memory secure? I remember the frustration of trying to use some of the big tech photo solutions only to find they fell short of what I needed. That's when I stumbled upon something truly remarkable, the Family Album Map. The Family Album Map was created to give parents a secure and easy way to share photos and videos with loved ones. It's an orderly and totally secure haven for your family's personal memories. I love that there's no third-party ads, no unwanted eyes, unlimited storage, and that it's totally free. So to all the parents who are out there still trying to use other messaging apps for your kids' photos, it's time to level up your family photo game with a free photo sharing app. Head over to the App Store today, search Family Album, one word, download the app, and start creating a legacy of love one photo at a time. Um, so going back to that original question around preparing for that, I, you know, if you can create a 
a labor aid or a, a labor drink mm-hmm. that is infused with those two herbs, the red raspberry leaf and the nettles, plus adding, you know, magnesium capsule in there. Um, mm-hmm. and then whatever flavor sounds good to you. Um, squeeze a lemon, squeeze a lemon in there, mm-hmm. grate up some ginger, you know, whatever mm-hmm. really, whatever's sounding good. Like if you haven't been liking ginger, don't put ginger in there. Mm-hmm. Maybe uh, you're a licorice person. Maybe you're Would a licorice person. Okay? Maybe you're a spearmint person. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, mm-hmm. any of those, maybe you like Basil. blueberry. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> any of that stuff. Uh, yeah. And you can, you know, make this, this drink that can be for labor, but also for that, in, um, that immediate postpartum time frame, mm-hmm. And, what I always tell my my clients in general is that anything that you use for the birth that you possibly don't use, you could use it during the postpartum mm-hmm. time frame. For sure. That yoga ball turns mm-hmm. into <laughs> a baby place soother, parent yeah. soother too. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Those maxi pads turn into, you know, maxi pads. I mean, yeah. the <laughs> same thing, but you yeah. still need something to catch fluid. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so there, there can be that application. I would say one of the greatest herbs for the postpartum, in, in my opinion, is ginger, as well as that can be really wonderful for the pregnancy time frame as mm-hmm. well. Everything from working with seasonal colds and flus and allergies to working with helping warm the ligaments as the body changes and settle the stomach for the, the hormonal shifts and all the queasiness that comes with having someone sit on your vital organs. Um, <laughs> so and if, go bigger and, and bigger and bigger. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. So mm. if you're able to have some sort of ginger infused food or tea or something like that brought into you and reach out to your local support network, meaning your friends and family, be like, that that would be a really great thing to have someone bring in. Like, can you bring in some ginger tea? Like, mm-hmm. very yeah. simple. Simple thing to make. If you want to see this right baby, stove, yeah. you got to bring... <laughs> You got to bring, you gotta bring a thermos gallons of, of <laughs> ginger yeah, tea. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, again, obviously, if you don't like ginger, don't go mm-hmm. don't go to- towards that one. But it has this really wonderful usage for that. And then, you know, as you move forward, there's already this idea that you know you can be creating a, a broth or a stock that has ginger in its recipe. Yeah. And in some of the recipes that you see in the notes, there's other uh, herbs in there like astragalus or wong chi, which I think I forgot to name as astragalus, mm-hmm. but mm-hmm. wong chi is astragalus, um, which gets used in traditional Chinese medicine um, to help support the spleen and specifically with helping the spleen hold organs in place so that fascinating that, i know it just yeah. like phew. well can i just say yeah go for it um speaking from purely personal place you know uh for a year before i got pregnant with my daughter i had mononucleosis and when you look into how, what's mm-hmm. affected the, it's the spleen right it's really affected by this blood yep. born disease a mucous membrane contact disease. And who knew? But, you know, <clears throat> it occurs to me that something like that, that would not have been addressed and was not and will not be uh, addressed by um, Western medicine, could have been the genesis for my perinatal depression and was never addressed, mm-hmm. right? right? No one was saying to me, eat root vegetable stews, you know, yeah. build your blood. Right. And hey, by the way, there's this thing called astragalus and you can find it and it's everywhere mm-hmm. and you should eat it. I mean, to this day. Yeah. I mean, I'm just learning this from you. I should have known, you know. That's amazing. Um, yeah. That's a, I knew some that's of the amazing other things. Connection. Yeah. yeah. But, um, you know, some of these things can affect us for the rest of our lives, if not addressed. And, right? and that's really why I think you and I and the the other folks that are so passionate about maternal care, postpartum care, is that this stuff will show up mm-hmm. if it's not properly nourished and addressed and sort of he- brought headlong mm-hmm. um, unexpectedly in different stages of our life. Yeah, You know, like we want the, the new mother to rest and nest for two weeks after giving birth so that she's not the 55 year old woman that has a prolapsed 
bladder, you know, mm-hmm. down the road, yeah. you know, because that is really what we know can happen. And we want to really hold that dear and sacredly so that we are taking care of them in this way that is addressing these types of things. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, going back to the point that, um, you know, stragulus is one of these herbs, it's a root and, and you go, you can go into almost any, um, acupuncture herb shop, Chinese shop in the area. And they'll have these bags of astragalus, which looks basically like a tongue depressor. It does. Yes. That's right. Yeah. So very woody, perfect for stalks. And mm-hmm. I'll, I'll just, you know, as a side note right now, um, it's always good to know the sources of your herbs, to know how they were treated, their, their where, can, they're, grown. where they're grown, mm-hmm. if they're fumigated, are they radiated? Mm-hmm. And so sometimes we do, we do need to be aware of that as if, uh, herbs are coming in from um, different sources that we don't um, have that information in. So go for the sources that you know um, of astragalus and any of these herbs really um, that are clean and something that you want to drink. But astragalus can be easily brought into a stock and you don't even have to think about, you know, taking it. Um, and it can be part of this, this nourishing broth that can help with, the integrity of your organ staying in place. Um, it also has the ability of helping with, with, um, sweating and sweating regulation and mm-hmm. something that we talk mm-hmm. also about all the time that no one else seems to talk about is the night sweats, mm-hmm. you know, postpartum mm-hmm. folks get night sweats. They can, not mm-hmm. to say everyone does, but mm-hmm. it's one of those things. It's a common feature. It's common enough. The, yeah. Because of the hormonal shifts in right. the first week, you're going from a period of fertility into a menopausal state that's very normal and right. natural. The absence but, of this hormone. Yeah. yeah. But the dramatic effect of it can, um, can sometimes actually require a kind of regulation a kind of support to regulate because you know sometimes it really is an ex- excessive mm-hmm. um, or or you know sort of under I mean I would say about myself like uh with my first pregnancy I probably needed more sweating than I had and with the second I I was much right. I was I was in a healthier place perhaps yeah. um, but it is an interesting phenomenon yeah so tell us about, um, so astragalus has so a ast- regulating effect. It, it helps us sweat and move things efficiently without going into the deficit of sweating too much, if uh, that makes sense. Like yeah, some well, you folks, can dehydrate you can yourself. You can dehydrate yourself really yeah. easily. You can um, create a, a scenario for cr- ha- having a chill if you're sweating too much and mm-hmm. your temperature and thermostat, internal thermostat is all over the place because of this new hormone balancing and regulation that's happening yeah. in guards. So what astragalus does is help um, temper some of that excessive sweating, mm-hmm. um, that one might go through during this, this time frame. And like you were speaking to, sweating is really important for the regulation of hormone. And because again, we are helping the new parent, you know, nest is in rest with their newborn because that's like what the newborn wants and that's what the postpartum body needs. Um, we're not going out and sweating because we're walking down the street or we're sweating because we're hiking up a hill or Mm -hmm. we're doing a workout. Mm -hmm. So that ability to express hormone efficiently through the skin is really beneficial to the postpartum body and things like astragalus and even ginger. If you're thinking of, you know, a recipe um, Mm -hmm. for something, um, you know, ginger helps us, it's a diaphoretic, so it helps us sweat. Mm -hmm. And so if you're working with something that helps you sweat with something that helps you sweat in a appropriate appropriate way, Mm -hmm. that can be a really great combination for dealing with things like the night sweats when, you know, I've had clients that for several weeks or even longer, they're just, you know, sleeping on beach towels and, Mm -hmm. you know, we get into the rhythm and not to say, you know, that's totally needed and that's totally fine. But being able to support with some of this other stuff to yeah. make it a little bit easier. Well, um, I could imagine a, a scenario where it would, it would be, um, I mean, I don't imagine that there's a, a single postpartum woman who wouldn't benefit, 
You know, it's often the case, Beth, that our clients have been on IV fluids for long periods during the course yes. of their labors. Yep. And, the, you know, they come home with uh, still an excessive amount of fl- yep. to it, fluids in their tissues. And that does need to be processed out through the kidneys, right. you know, through and, and through a certain amount of sweating, no doubt. And I could imagine that there, there again would be a place where the ginger and astragalus would be very, very beneficial to help the body do this task. Mm-hmm. Um, that is, um, normal to postpartum because we do have a- extra blood volume and fluid in that transition, right? We, we gained it during pregnancy right. and now we're divesting it in very many different ways, including by breastfeeding mm-hmm. uh, but uh, but then when you have this overload that that many women have as a result of their uh, birth story their birth journey I could imagine that would be really 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 helpful so that's wonderful to yeah. know about both of those things and and as you know in in many cultures where ginger is part of the landscape uh, it's part of what everybody eats and drinks exactly. all the time. Fascinating because I think Esther and I both come from a cultural anthropology background. Mm-hmm. And I know a lot of fine herbalists out there that mm-hmm. come from a cultural anthropology background. And what you start seeing, especially if you use food or herbs or plant medicine as the lens that we're looking through, most cultures have some type of basic herb infused dish that includes like protein and a multigrain. You know, so mm-hmm. where we see rose con pollo or we see the ginger and rice chicken dish, congee, mm-hmm. um, you know, these are things that yeah, really represent. Madras or, yeah, exactly. So. Mm-hmm. Um, any of the, like a, a barley uh, and lamb soup, mm-hmm. you know, something of that or of that nature that those components. Oxtail. Oxtail. With oats. <laughs> yeah, yeah oats, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Mm-hmm. They're both things that are densely nourishing as well as help stabilize blood sugar. Yeah. You know, things that can go for a longer burn in um, the metabolism. Yeah, right. So important. I mean, one of the reasons I try to get my families doing small meals often Mm -hmm. is to help with that blood sugar component of the endocrine system. Right. So that we're not adding blood sugar stress stress to... All the other shifts that are happening. Right. Yeah. That's great. Do you want to spend a few minutes talking about herbalism around the subject of breastfeeding? Because I know Mm -hmm. for our clients, they're hearing prenatally, they're hearing all kinds of stories about what gets called lactation, which as you know, I have a gut reaction to that term. We're breastfeeders. We're mammals. They're mammary glands. It's true that lactation is a nice, you know, Latin based word, but uh, (laughs) um, (laughs) we're not machines that do this thing. Right. But I also know that there's, there's a way in which our both pregnant and then newly postpartum moms Mm -hmm. are in a position to misinterpret how to use these herbs that are being thrown at them yep. and that there's some, I think, fundamental information that you can impart to our clients, our, our listeners whoops, about how to make maybe some good decisions. And by the way, one way to make a good decision is to employ, you know, a perinatal herbalist to help you assess your situation and make good decisions. So if you're if you're really feeling overwhelmed and clueless, please look out into your community and find somebody who specializes in this way, mm-hmm. as does Beth. But Beth, why don't you just tell us a little bit about some of those very popular herbs that come in every tea that people buy at the shop that might yeah. need a little bit of, um, I don't want to say caution, but just understanding. Yeah. And I just want to sort of highlight the fact that not everyone needs a breastfeeding or lactation tea. Mm -hmm. I would say that when I am advising my clients uh, and talking about like what sounds good to them, it can make sense to have a lactation tea for those 
for several days mm-hmm. as we're, as they're learning, the parent is learning as well as their, their care providers are learning what their milk supply, what their flow is like, what their baby is like, all these components mm-hmm. and having that tea around can be really beneficial as things are shifting and increasing in supply. So mm-hmm. when milk is starting to shift and increase on supply on in and around day three, that at that point we'll sort of know if you need these herbs called galactagogues or herbs that support lactation, breastfeeding, milk production. Mm-hmm. Um, and from there you can sort of assess whether it makes sense to continue to use it or not. Because if you are working with oversupply, we really don't want to be working with a lactation tea because where a a lactation tea tends to go, uh, build upon, say, the components of a uh, a pregnancy tea, because again, like we were talking about, like most of the time, these postpartum teas also has nettles, also has red raspberry leaf, because they're mm-hmm. talking about the full constitution of the mom, um, including the uterus, including um, mammary health. Mm-hmm. That they also include often sometimes things like fenugreek, and mm-hmm. fenugreek ties back into um, that conversation piece that you brought up around Ayurvedic and Indian herbs that are infused into the daily life of people who are eating these herbs Mm -hmm. um, Mm -hmm. on a daily basis. But for folks that aren't necessarily eating this on a daily basis, we couldn't have a certain level of, of, of newness to the herbs and the, 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 element that fenugreek has on the body is to maximize and increase the receptors that milk can be made. Mm -hmm. And Mm -hmm. for folks that... Just prolactin receptors. Right, exactly. Mm -hmm. And so if someone already has a ton of those, um, we don't necessarily need to be boosting that. Mm -hmm. So I would, you know, help bring in a level of a, a... a clinical eye or critical eye seeing the ingredients of, of a, of an, uh, of the tea so that if it has fenugreek, just know that it has fenugreek. And if you have an oversupply, then, you know, probably switch out and even just drink a pregnancy tea would be fine mm-hmm. uh, or any herbal non caffeinated tea outside of things like peppermint or basil tea, which I don't know a lot of people drinking basil tea, but things that possibly could dry out milk supply and peppermint is Sage. what it is. Sage. No, I don't know why anybody would drink sage tea. It's nasty, but <laughs> but yes, it's you strong, would, right? You would it's drink like it if you're trying to dry up a milk supply. You would be that drinking would be it the reason to dry up it. supply. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And on the other side of that, like we, we, as with most things in life, there's a spectrum, right? Mm-hmm. And most folks um, are in the middle of, with the you know the bell curve of the of the spectrum, or um, and then there are folks with little supply and a lot of supply. And for the folks that are really working hard to boost their milk supply, I think it is a really good idea to be working with an herbal tea just and pregnancy, or excuse me, um, a breastfeeding tea because that's a case where we are trying to really increase mom hydration, increase um, the general nutrition and nurturing of the mom, plus having things like the fenugreek or the blessed thistle or um, things like fennel um, mm-hmm. in there to help increase milk supply on that one. Mm-hmm. But I think what I, I, what I often see too is people already planting the seeds of fear mm-hmm. in, in the pregnant folk of like breastfeeding is going to be really hard. And I'm really not trying to s- oversimplify the intensity of having someone depending on your mammary juice um, Mm -hmm. as being really intense um, in many ways, but that it's already really hard and you need, you need this product. You you have to medicate yourself because you couldn't do it otherwise. You need, it's not the truth of it. You need to have formula at home just in case. Right. Um, yeah, it's the same mentality. It's, a, it's an intervention. It's yeah. the idea that you will need an intervention. Right. So than we yeah. can we can afford to wait and see and right. see how you're doing and right. and assume that because you're a mammal, it's probably going to work out. Right, and, and it's nice to have support, but let's have this the exactly. support that's appropriate. Right, and I think that's often what gets substituted in is like this idea that I can have 
this this herbal supplement that is supplementing support, mm-hmm. which isn't you know, right. and, and it's not the same to have a reassuring doula or instead of that, you know, a box of tea from a name brand company that says you're going to make milk if you drink. Right. Or you have your not support yeah. or you have this bottle of fenugreek. And mm-hmm. what I see some folks doing is um, just taking it with the expectation that it's there to help milk supply, which it does, but it does it in this very specific and an even more intense way because it helps increase the uh, areas that can create milk. Mm-hmm. And for someone it's who does it, it right. actually makes you have more cells. Right. And you see, milk. and yeah. you see that with um, any of the things that have that anise or uh, fennel licorice mm-hmm. flavor um, is that, that um, comfort or that, uh, bio, uh, bio medical element, um, the anathorth, I believe it is that it actually mimics estrogen. Mm -hmm. And so it has an effect on our endocrine system to boost and stimulate that. So Mm -hmm. again, not everyone needs that and not everyone needs to start taking tons of capsules of fenugreek. And it, it just is, you know, again, something where you're already so busy, during the postpartum time frame, um, parenting and, you know, taking care of yourself when you can that, you know, taking a handful of fenugreek three times a day is another thing you got to do. Right. And that's where I do hold a place of, of wanting people to have education around things like fenugreek so that if you are going to be taking fenugreek, you're taking it in a way that you know how much you're taking. Yeah. So that maybe it is in, a single capsule form, or it is in a formula, uh, a, a formulated um, form, meaning that it has, it's part of a formula. It's not mm-hmm. just many Greek. Yeah, so that a is a little bit, formula a little bit more balance to things going on. Yeah. There but are it, other elements that right. are balancing. And mm-hmm. under the, and under the, uh, the, support of someone like a lactation consultant, a perinatal herbalist, an acupuncturist, a seasoned doula, folks that has seen how this works as mm-hmm. well as know the research around it yeah, and the physiology, the physiology it. around it and um, can really help what is needed for, for that family um, yeah. and for that, for that mom. Yeah. So that you're just not trying to, you know. Yeah. And let's be clear. We're not, we don't want to discourage anyone who may lack for community support from doing some good research about their particular situation. Exactly. Um, because uh, both Beth and I know from personal experience that our healing journeys were initiated from ourselves. Right. Right. We knew that there was something that needed addressing and we looked out into the world and tried to educate ourselves about what would be a good way to do that. And so Um, we encourage that. And we also, you know, also from that same vantage point and all of our, you know, education experience know that, um, you know, you just don't pick an herb and throw a ton of it at a situation, right? You want to have a broader perspective than that if possible. Well, Beth, this has been amazing. So much great information and perspective from you. Would you like to tell our listeners how to contact you if they're interested in um, your services? Sure. So folks can find me um, online at um, mindfuldoulaarts.com. I also you know, have a Facebook page that is under the same name that you can find my contact information and also email me through that website as well. Um, and I would welcome anyone who wants to contact me or even talk more about this in the capacity. I, I mean, as proven, we could talk about this for a long amounts of time and oh, yes. really appreciate the opportunity to come and talk and be part of the fourth trimester with all you lovely folks out there. Yeah. Fantastic. Well, um, yeah. Thanks again, Beth. And I'm imagining too on our fourth trimester podcast, Facebook page, this is going to really spark some wonderful uh, uh, comment back and forth as well. 
So people, please um, find your way to uh, our Facebook page when you get a chance. Um, we're going to sign off now and um, thank Beth one more time and hope that uh, all of you out in our listenership are having a really, really wonderful time perinatal period. Tell your Tell your friends about this. And I just want to remind you, not just your friends who are in the perinatal period of life. This is good information for people who may never have children of their own. This in order for them to be uh, supportive community members, whether that's your your sister or sister-in-law or you know, <laughs> the the guy who lives next door and likes to work on trucks out in his driveway. Like everybody could benefit from learning about this part of, of human existence. Okay. Take care, everybody. Be well. Be well. You can subscribe to this podcast in order to hear more from us. Thank you for listening, everyone, and I hope you'll join us next time on the fourth trimester. The theme music on this podcast was created by Sean Trott. Hear more at soundcloud.com slash Sean Trott. Special thanks to my true loves, my husband Ben, daughter Penelope, and baby girl Evelyn. Don't forget to share the fourth trimester podcast with any new and expecting parents. I'm Sarah Trott. Goodbye for now. Hello again. Bicycle man, I know you're doing all that you can. I wrote the song, simple and true. I wrote the song, I'll sing a song for you. You got your wheels, you got your gears. You ride around town without any fear You got your pedals, you got your brakes You always wear your helmet for safety's sake